I'm Esther Aguilera, President and CEO of the Latino Corporate Directors Association. I want to thank Ahmad for the opportunity to be part of today's summit and recognize the contributions of the Silicon Valley Leadership Group in helping to promote greater representation in our region and our nation. Our studies with LCDA tell us there are vast inequities in the way Latinos are represented in the boardroom. Latinos are least likely to serve on boards. They hold less than 3% of Fortune 1000 company board seats. In California, it is only 2%. And in California, Latinos are 40% of the population. If Latinos were a nation, they would be the eighth largest economy in the world, right behind India. More diverse boards and voices leads to more informed decision-making while producing better results for companies. And talking about corporate connection to representation at the ground level is our next panel. From communities to conference rooms, welcome our panelists, Senator Maria Elena Durazo, Chair of the Latino Caucus, Senator Stephen Bradford, Chair of the Black Caucus, and Rick Callender, President of the California-Hawaii State Conference of the NAACP. Our moderator is Dr. Robin Rodriguez, Founding Director, Bulusan Center for Philippinex Studies and Professor of Asian American Studies at UC Davis. Good morning, thank you. So we'll go ahead and just launch right in um, as a concluding panel. Uh, the title of this panel is From Communities to Conference Rooms because we want to illuminate pathways towards greater inclusivity for businesses. We also want to recognize how the Justice for George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, and Ahmaud Arbery movements challenged corporate standards for recognizing and addressing systemic racism. Companies that had not previously taken social justice stances began to publicly denounce racism, echo public demands for police accountability and call for deeper corporate investments in diversity among other actions. So the question here is, in your opinion, is this moment of racial reckoning different? And how can we harness this moment to build substantially better companies? Moreover, given last month's capital events, how can we continue to show up and speak out against white supremacy and anti-Blackness in 2021 and the years to come? So I'm going to start here with Senator Bradford and follow with Mr. Callender. Thank you. I was a little late on getting on there, so I didn't hear the your entire question, if you wouldn't mind repeating it, please. Sure, sure thing, Senator Bradford. So the panel's entitled, entitled from communities to conference rooms because we want to illuminate pathways towards greater, greater inclusivity for businesses. We know we want to recognize how uh, the Black Lives Matter movements um, from last uh, year really challenged corporate standards. Uh, and so really the question is at this moment of racial reckoning, is it different? And how can we harness this moment to build substantially better companies? And again, given what happened last month in the Capitol, how can we continue to show up and speak out? Yes, thank you. In many ways, it's different, but uh, sadly, in many ways, it's the same. Uh, it's different because we did see a lot of our allies, uh, our non-African-American, our white, our Latino, our Asian allies who came out uh, during the Black Lives Matter uh, movement last year, especially after the killing of George Floyd. But uh, in many ways, what we saw uh, last month on January 6th, uh, a predominantly white male angry mob lets us know that the racist, that ex uh, racism that exists in America still exists. It's still fervent and, and, and it's still effective. Uh, I think right now, corporate America has realized that uh, we're going to walk from those uh, companies who continue to not speak out. Uh, we're going to speak with our dollars, uh, and uh, they clearly understand the impact uh, of black dollars. And I'm glad there is an awareness, especially I want to commend uh, the WNBA, those women who stood out boldly, uh, the NBA, uh, LeBron James, 
these are billion dollar industries and predominantly the folks who put butts in seats in these uh, sports venues are African Americans and we're sick and tired of uh, being uh, relegated to second class citizens in America. And so uh, corporate America is listening. I'm, I'm, I appreciate opportunity uh, right here to participate with the Silicon Valley uh, leadership group and, and their willingness to hear us out and uh, willingness to talk to uh, the tech industry and folks in the Silicon Valley to understand that we are, we're, our voices should be heard. Uh, we, and there needs to be a change. And it's not enough to talk about uh, racial equality. It's about demonstrating it. It's not enough to say, I'm not a racist. It's now time to be anti-racist uh, in, in, in the world and uh, especially here in America. And so I'm um, excited to join uh, organizations like the NAACP who've been doing this forever and fighting for equality here in this country. And uh, so um, there is a change, but it's still much work to be done. Hey, that's that's a good segue, Wait, Mr. Calendar, would you like to pick up on that? And answer yeah, that absolutely. Too? First, yeah, uh, absolutely. First, thank you for the invitation today from the Silicon Valley Leadership Group. This is a really, this is a bold conversation to be having. Issues of race are always bold conversations, but what's sad is that it took a death of a black man under the knee of a police officer to be shown on national TV for folks all over the world to be shocked into saying that the fear of African-Americans and that and what our children have to live through every day, systematic racism, it's real. It's not just about in the criminal justice system, it's in the boardrooms as well. So obviously diversity is the best thing that companies can enjoy for making for better decision making. You know, we're talking about profitability, employee engagement. We're talking about uh, corporate reputation. We're talking about this is how corporations, once they embrace diversity, this is how they make money. So last month's riots, as Senator Bradford was talking about, once again, it gave America and the world a front row seat into looking into seeing and understanding how white supremacy is truly part of the underbelly and the fabric of America. Now, if I was to tell you last year that we'd be watching an attempted takeover of our government by a rogue group of white supremacists trying to get the South to rise again, and they were joined by conspiracy theorists, would you believe me? No, you'd say you're crazy, right? So how, how can you show up to get to the, the, to the bottom of the question? I asked you not to just talk about it, to be about it. What are your investments in racial equality and justice organizations? Are you at the table to really talk about systematic racism? Or are you simply giving it lip service? Investing in justice organizations with the same commitment that you invest with R&D, that's what needs to be done. Let's not just say, whoa, this was a moment in time. Let's invest in these organizations and let's invest in change. Right, no, thank you for that. I think uh, the next question really, I think builds on some of the points you've made really, which is about um, these terms, diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging. Right, these are now being addressed by businesses, though, for a lot of us, for all of us, really, on this panel. This is a new version of what's really a decades long conversation. Uh, you know, earlier, Dr. Lowry had made this point about uh, the, the term de diversity and the importance of making very explicit that when we're talking about diversity, we're talking about people of color, we're talking about women. I would even add to be even more explicit that when we're talking about diversity, it should be about historically marginalized groups in the United States, racialized groups um, in the US, and that kind of importing diversity, for instance, of elites from other countries may not also, isn't going to fit the bill either. So for the, this, uh, the next question that I wanted to add all of you is to focus our conversation here on equity as a concept that's distinct from equality, particularly where race is concerned. How do you define racial equity versus equality in the context of organizations and companies. And I'll start here with uh, Senator Durazo and then end with uh, Mr. Callender. Thank you very much, Robin, appreciate it. And um, to all my colleagues on, on the panel, uh, my colleagues, Senator Bradford, everyone and uh, the leadership uh, group, the Silicon Valley leadership group, um, there is a big difference uh, between equity and equality. You know, equality sort of treats people with this one size fits all approach, whereas equity is out to really fix the outcomes, not just upfront what you say or you try to do, but what's the outcome. And uh, we want policies that address outcomes that get results, as uh, Mr. Calder was saying, where it's most needed. 
Um, and let me just give you an example that we're experiencing. I think someone in the previous panel might have made reference to this, but let's take the pandemic in, in LA County. The Latino population is 47%. The positive cases are 70%. The number of deaths are triple that of whites. Triple, imagine that, triple the number of deaths. Um, is the solution to provide an equal number of vaccines? I don't think so. So you, you, you can say, well, we're being equal, we're giving all these communities the equal number, but where is the depth of the problem? Where is the real problem taking place? You can't just use an equal number. Um, you know, uh, Latinos are getting 23% of the first doses. Whites are getting 22%. That doesn't solve the problem. We need a uh, greater. Blacks are 6% of the deaths and only getting 4% of the vaccines. The other issue is besides race and part of, of, of our issue of equity is income levels. If you're, if you're making less than $40,000 a year, you're 38% higher in getting the, um, um, in getting uh, positive uh, high, than higher incomes. So, you know, poor areas, 60 deaths per 100,000. Wealthy areas, 17 deaths. What is, what is going on? And so there's something deeper here it's not about, part of it is, let's get those vaccines into the communities that really need it, but it's also something much deeper. Who's overrepresented as essential workers? You know, who are the ones who take care of our families? Who are the, you know, providing, taking care of our, our elderly and our chi uh, children, farm workers, warehouse workers, jobs that aren't uh, teleworking, um, uh, you know, the number of wage earners in, in each household. I mean, the number of children in each household. So really, uh, as the LA Times said, I think it was today, the tale of two recoveries. Low wage workers, minority owned businesses are gonna face the longer recovery. And, and business and corporations are in a position to change this so that it doesn't take longer for our communities of color uh, to recover and nor should it take longer for communities of color to face debts um, because of this pandemic. Mr. Callender. Yeah, and thank you, Senator Raza, you said it so very well. It's, it's for, for me, equity is about what people need to enjoy full and healthy lives. Equality is about ensuring that everyone gets the same things in, in order to enjoy those full healthy lives. And the pandemic has definitely showed that equity and equality is still not there. What we know is that not everyone is starting from the same position in life. Obstacles have existed for many and others. There's still other obstacles that have been placed in their way. And, and as you see the rollout of the vaccines, it's obvious that there's obstacles that are there. 2.9% of the African-American population in the state of California has, has received the vaccination. 12% of Latinos, there's something wrong there. We're not seeing equity or equality. And so for companies, what is what is I'm hoping for? I'm hoping that you're engaging in this equity and these equality conversations with not only educational institutions, institutions to ensure that the pipeline is rich in diversity. But what are you doing in organizations to train up your employees to rise and to grow within your organizations? Are your employee resource groups just about getting people together to celebrate Black History Month or some month over food? Or are you engaging them in the business conversations about what their needs are as employees and how to better support their needs and how to ensure that they're rising up in this organization? What are the demographics of your contracting look like? Is there a fair and balanced with black, brown, small businesses, women-owned businesses? Are you making sure that BIPOC businesses are able to, uh, to enter into the contracting? What do your HR policies look like? Last year, I was fighting with a big corporation with their preference to hire from only Ivy League schools. Hmm, what do you think that means? Why didn't they say they had the same positive relationship with HBCUs or with Latino, uh, 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 mostly Latino institutions? Why is it those institutions aren't given the same amount of respect? Well, are, are you as companies, are you standing up for legislation that suppresses things such as voting rights and takes away from equ equity and equality? And where do you stand as, as your organization, as your company on the national conversation of a $15 minimum wage? These are the kind of things that I'd love to see folks in Silicon Valley lead these conversations. All right, thank you for that, uh, Mr. Callender, especially uh, as our next question really is about legislation. 
So of course, the Civil Rights Act of 1964, the Lilly Ledbetter Act of 2009, most recently California, uh, uh, the California's Assembly Bill 979, and I would even add the Domestic Workers Bill of Rights, right? Because of course, when we think about the intersections of gender and race, we think about leaning in uh, for women, that often means leaning on women of color uh, as domestic workers. But in terms of legislation, is there legislation for, uh, and this is of course for uh, Senators Bradford and Durazo, are there, is there legislation that you're working on or have introduced this session around corporate diversity in America? Where can the business community be a constructive partner in driving solutions given our shared aims? Senator Bradford first, please. Yes, thank you. Uh, yes, I, I'm, I'm muted. Yes, uh, this year I reintroduced uh, insurance diversity. Uh, it's a piece of legislation that I did last year with our insurance commissioner, Ricardo Lada, and making sure that our insurance companies are diverse uh, in their uh, leadership. Uh, as we all know, the last bastion of white man uh, authority and leadership is in the banking and the insurance industry. So we're looking at all those things that were just mentioned by Mr. Callender, your contracting, your employment, your HR, far too often with many of these companies, it's just a check the box scenario. So uh, this bill will uh, put together a task force to uh, look at diversity in the insurance industry. They will have to voluntarily report back uh, the diversity, again, of their board, their upper management, and uh, set goals to make sure that they achieve real diversity in the workplace. Also, last year, I uh, authored uh, social equity um, in the cannabis space. And regards to where you fall in this, uh, right now, uh, industry that's been only three years in existence, it's 85% white male dominant. And we want to make sure that black and brown, women-owned uh, individuals have an opportunity to reap the benefits of what we've uh, touted as a billion dollar industry. And uh, we're seeing it uh, being legalized all across this country. 36 states have legalized cannabis in some degree. We need to make sure that people of color, so I have a bill that uh, addresses that as well. And uh, and we're working on SB 595, which was the fee waiver and deferral to make sure, again, many of these small, uh, businesses which are minority owned are not burdened with the over uh, uh burdensome cost of entry and many of these white individuals have venture capitalists who are financing their way having corporations who are invested in them so this free waiver deferral will allow uh, people of color greater entry into this market as well thank you senator durasso thank you um and I want to uh, thank my colleague, Senator Bradford, because he's really, really been at the forefront, as he said, all of these uh, various uh, proposals for the legislature. Uh, we were all proud supporters of Assemblymember Holden's bill to require more diversity in the boardroom. But diversity is very difficult to legislate, very difficult to legislate. And so Frankly, that's why I think there's so little diversity in corporate boardrooms. Um, we, uh, we need to find other ways and, and, and the corporate leadership uh, need to take ownership of why there isn't the diversity that there should be uh, in the boardrooms. Uh, one way that um, I thought we could help train and prepare more of our, of our youth, uh, youth of color is um, the uh, California Dream Loan Program. And uh, what this did was expand to graduate programs uh, what our dreamers could have access to so that through education, they become, they should be, uh, you know, the candidates for all of these positions and, and leadership roles in, in the corporate uh, world. Um, we have in, through the Latino Caucus, we have what's called the Unseen Latina Initiative. And this is also to find out what are those obstacles and disparities uh, because Latina women really are at the very, 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 very bottom of the uh, uh, totem pole and uh, uh, white men and then white women. So we get to the bottom of the totem pole at 42 cents to the dollar of a white man. Um, there's something really wrong with that that could be 
fixed. Um, unfortunately, the corporate community has a deep legacy of, of these practices that have not allowed and have actually stopped um, more integration in the uh, in the boardroom. So there's a there's a lot that could be done by the by the business community. Thank you. Thank you for that, uh, Senator Russell. Um, to end, we're coming to a close for this panel. But once again, to end today's event on the theme of activating change, can the Silicon Valley serve as a capital of innovation in building a moral economy when it comes to racial equity? Cultures, whether in community organizations, legislative chambers, or corporate offices, don't change overnight. What will sustaining change look like? Maybe I'll start here with you, Mr. Callender, uh, then move on to uh, Senator Rez, and hopefully we'll have some words also from Senator Bradford. Thank you. Sustaining change looks like what are you doing as an individual? What are you doing from your corporate seat? Have you, are you just talking about it or are you going to be about it? Are you really uh, um, investing in racial equity organizations? Or are you just giving $5,000 because you think it's the right thing to do and then you can check off that box? As I believe Senator Bradford or Senator Rosso said, this isn't about checking a box. This is about stepping up your game. This is about doing the right thing. Don't just say that we saw this on TV. You know, we're in the middle of the movement. So we've checked the box and we're there really be engaged and really be about it. So I look to everyone from your corporate seat, make sure you are investing correctly and you're investing your time correctly so that when you look back, you said, I did the right thing at the right time. Senator Russell and then Senator Bradford. Uh, we each have an individual responsibility to set the bar, uh, to set the bar higher. Uh, but that needs, you know, reinforcement for, for what we're doing. Uh, in my life, I became a, a union organizer because I believe that you do the most good for the most people when we empower it, them to do it for themselves. And so this is a com combination of our own responsibility. But if we don't, if we aren't given those opportunities, then people have to push forward. And, um, you know, we shouldn't have to push forward all the time, but if that's what it takes, that's what it takes. And in, in my lifetime, uh, giving that empowerment uh, to women, uh, women of color, immigrant women uh, was very, very powerful. It created a lot of change um, because we had to push it. So do we have to push this every time? Can't this be done as a real partnership? And that's what I'm hoping uh, through, the leadership group that we could come up with some partnerships instead of us having to just push, push, push all the time. Senator Bradford. Yes, and I agree totally. We just can't do it by legislation alone. Corporations have to embrace this. They have to believe it. They have it has to be part of their corporate DNA. And I think Silicon Valley is a prime example of how you lead the world and technology and innovation lead in diversity as well. We buy your product. So the folks who work for you to look just as diverse as your customer base. And people want to do business with people who look like them. So I would say not only in your boardrooms, but in your workforce and uh, your outreach and your commercials, show that diversity because we're the ones buying your product, but very rarely are we the ones being hired. Again, it has to be a part of that DNA of the company. Just can't talk about it. And that's what we found far too often. It's a feel good for the moment. And, and, and it has to be a movement that is truly embraced by your all the people in your, in your company. And many times they don't. So I think Silicon Valley prime is a prime opportunity with the technology, with all the resources available, uh, to lead this charge and start shutting off people who are racist like you were doing during the election cycle. That was the power of Silicon Valley. That was the power of technology. And I think you can do that e even more so today. Wonderful. Thank you so much uh, for to everyone. Uh, thank you, of course, to the uh, SDLG. And looking forward to next year's summit, uh, that this is the first summit, of course, uh, especially given that the Bay Area really is home to so many racial justice movements has been home uh, to the uh, to folks doing this work. 
uh, that this is happening now is wonderful. And we hope that this is, I think for uh, speaking on behalf of the panelists, that the, that the group uh, continues this conversation and makes good on, um, on these pledges uh, in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Rodriguez. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Thank, you. Thank you, Ms. Gallagher. Thank you for this opportunity. This clip brought to you by the following sponsors. Thanks for watching. For more information and clips, go to svlg.org.